Hey, what's going on everybody? It's JB, not the ranch mechanic. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to rename the channel yet, but this is the first video that I'm going to put out at our new place in Utah. Um, we have finally moved and we have spent the last week, actually almost two weeks, getting settled in. So that bit of stress is behind us. We're doing much better now. We're getting settled in, getting unpacked slowly. This is my new office. Um, this is where I will be working unless I'm in my bedroom, pretty much all the time. I work from home now, which is fantastic. An uh, IT job as a government contractor does have its perks in that regard. And another huge boon is that, as you saw in the beginning of the video, I know they sound like crap, but I've got my drums back. What you saw me playing at the intro there was a 1978 Ludwig Black Diamond Pearl five-piece drum set. Um, with an additional Premier 14 by 6 snare drum. And the cool thing about this drum set is that I've owned it for 27 years. I got it when I was 12 years old and I think I paid 250 bucks for it from my uncle. I really have not played those drums in 15 years, honestly. So about half the time that I've owned them. Um, I, I broke them down and put them into storage right after I got married 17 years ago. I got them out of storage back in 2013, I think, for about six months before we moved, and then they went right back into storage. I did put new Remo heads on it when I was a teenager, um, and I've, I only replaced the heads once, and they need new skins really, really bad. They sound terrible, that bass drum especially. None of them are tuned correctly. Uh, you know, I just cranked them down a little bit because being in storage for as long as they've been, the heat kind of gets to them and you know you got your tuning lugs and hot and cold to make some tend to loosen up. Luckily I did a really really good job of wrapping them with both packing cellophane as well as bubble wrap so they were pretty well protected from you know external damage but unfortunately the heat and cold got to the wraps on the shells a little bit and kind of cracked a few of them and caused them to peel a little bit which is very typical of drums from that era. The late 70s is right at the beginning of the point when Ludwig went really downhill unfortunately. Um, these are still a decent set, but this is basically when they were gluing the shells on. So not the greatest, I mean, it looks really cool, but not the greatest as far as aesthetics go over time. They don't hold up that well. These look okay. They really do. I'm surprised at how good they look actually, but I'm going to go through this drum set and this will be a series of videos, but basically what these series of videos is going to be about is I'm going to go through this entire drum set they're going to get new batter heads, new resonant heads, and then go through disassemble every single drum that I own, the mounted toms, the floor tom, the bass drum, my premier snare, and, and I did not even realize that I own this. I've owned these drums for 27 years and I had no idea that this was part of the kit, but that Ludwig snare drum sitting over there that I was playing is actually a Ludwig superphonic. <laughs> I had no idea that I owned a Ludwig Supra until I got them out of storage and I started looking at it and I started pulling date codes and stuff off of the serial numbers and I just started Googling because I wanted to see maybe if these have improved in value a little bit over time and surprisingly they have, but everything as far as that snare drum goes tracks making it a Ludwig Superphonic as far as everything I can see. So that is super exciting. I've always loved that snare drum. It always has played way better and sounded way better to my ear that even the brand new Premier snare that I got when I was 12, right before I bought this kit, I got the snare drum first and started playing on that and practicing. And then I got the drums and then I bought my cymbals. I had drums without cymbals for like six months while I was saving up to get some cheap Zildjian ZVT cymbals. But I'm really excited about that Ludwig Superphonic. So that's gonna be cool. I'm going to go through all of these things, clean them up, get them completely squared away. And the other cool thing that came with this kit is sitting on the, the bench here. Or my desk, I guess. Not really a workbench. Not yet, anyway. Um, but this is a late 70s, original vintage Ludwig Speed King. This is the pedal that I got with this kit. Just like the Superphonic, I had no idea what I had. I've hated this pedal since I got the kit. I thought it was old. I thought it was outdated. I wanted to get something with, you know, awesome bearings, chain-driven, double-kick, blah, blah, blah. All that new stuff that was coming out back in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. I thought that this thing was a piece of junk. I had no idea that this is the pedal that John Bonham used. I didn't have a clue. I was clueless when I bought this kit. I was 
clueless all through my 20s into my 30s. And I'm just now, as I've gotten into machinery restorations over the last 10 years or so, now that I've gotten my drums back out, I'm just now realizing what I have. This needs a lot of work. It really does. Typical with these pedals, it squeaks a lot. The bearings in the back are completely thrashed. This one is worn just about in half. I have no uh, set screw for the toe clamp. That's gone. So I have no idea what happened to that. I had it at one point, but it just over the years being moved from box to box, it probably just worked its way loose and got uh, lost into the process. And then um, you look at the screw adjustments, there's actually um, springs inside each one of these vertical columns on both sides of the beater. <laughs> the screws, I don't know if you can see that or not, are screwed probably all the way in as far as they'll go. I, maybe there's a little bit of travel left in them, but I'm sure that these springs have just been cranked for decades and are completely worn out. So I found a place online that actually still has some uh, Ludwig Speed King parts. I forget what the website is, but I'll link that into the, in, either on the video or in the description. But I ordered two new springs for this guy and a new uh, set screw for the toe clamp. So we're gonna take this thing apart completely. We're gonna clean this thing up. We're gonna take these bearing caps off. We're gonna pull these bearings out. We're gonna take every single thing apart, just like I do with any machinery restoration. We're gonna do the same thing to this pedal. We're gonna clean everything out. We're gonna replace those springs. We're gonna clean up the toe clamp and put a new set screw in it. Um, the beater is actually, it's a, an OEM Ludwig felt beater and it's in really good shape still. There's no flat spots on it at all. So I might just try to clean that up a little bit, but it still works just fine. So that's the goal here. We're going to go ahead and get everything cleaned up and get this thing back into much better shape. And I'm hoping that once we do that, I will like this pedal a whole lot more. It's going to be a lot smoother, a lot faster, because right now, I mean, it's still, it rebounds okay, but it, there's still quite a bit of drag on it. And trying to do doubles with it, it's just, there's not enough rebound coming off of this thing for you to really play fast with it. Granted, it's been a long time since I've played drums on a regular basis. I'm very, very out of practice, as you heard. But I'm going to do everything I can to get this drum set back into much better shape and make this pedal much, much more usable. Because the Ludwig Speed King and the Ludwig Superphonic are probably two of the greatest things that Ludwig has ever produced. So I'm really excited that I own those two things, and I'm just now finding out that I actually have a piece of history that is really, really cool. And we're going to bring this thing back around. So... Sorry for the long-winded intro. It's been a minute since I filmed anything, so I want to give you guys kind of a quasi-update as we go along here, but let's get into it. All right, guys, got this thing on the bench here. Went into the garage and dug out some tools here. So I got my gunsmith punches here, which are actually roll pin punches, so we can get these roll pins out of here without completely destroying them. Um, yeah, we're just gonna start pulling this thing apart. Um, I'm really curious to see how bad this grease is inside of here. Um, as you can see, this isn't rust, this is actually grease that has melted melted out of the bearings inside here. There's two ball bearings and uh, two springs and two pistons inside here, and that's how you get your, rather than being an extension spring like on most bass pedals, these are actually compression springs. So there's a cam inside here that pushes down on the little uh, piston, which then compresses the spring, and that's how you get your rebound. So we're just going to jump into this. Let's get this uh, beater pulled off first of all. We'll just take this wing nut completely out. It is a little bit bent but I'm thinking I can probably straighten that out, hopefully without uh, completely ripping one of these ears off. But yeah, years and years of use. And the ear just slides right out. And we'll uh, dis disassemble this thing as it currently is. We'll just take the, the footboard and pedal off of the tower assembly here. It just slides out. We'll deal with this part last. I don't have my Dremel down here. I'm gonna have, these are basically riveted in place, so we're going to have to grind this pin off in order to get to the uh, brass bushings inside here. Looking at this more closely, there is remnants of the bearing on each side here, so there is some stuff left there. But I, again, I, without pulling that pin out first, I'm not going to have any idea what condition these holes are in. If they're egged out at all, we're just going to have to drill them to a bigger size and uh, size the bushings to fit. Because we certainly don't want to put new bushings in there with an egged out hole. It'll just destroy the bushing and, and cause it to wear out or even break. So. And this looks like a like a silver hammer tone type paint, so I might hit this with some uh, silver rust-oleum once we get all this rust off of it and get it cleaned up. 
and uh, I'm throw some 2K clear on it so it lasts a little bit longer. This is just bare aluminum, I think. So once we get this apart, we can clean this up, get this little swivel heel pad off of here and get the rest of this stuff cleaned up. But for right now, we're gonna focus on the, the main pedal assembly here. And you can just see, I mean, that's just years of junk. I mean, there's hair and lint and all kinds of crap on here. It's pretty gross. So we'll just have to see what we can see here. But first and foremost, let's go ahead and pull pull these screws out if they'll even come out. In fact, I am gonna, I'm going to hit them with a little bit of PB Blaster because you can see even down in here. I don't know if you guys can see that or not, if I'm on, on the camera or not here, but... There's all kinds of grease that has melted out of here over over the years of this thing is sitting in storage. So we're going to give it the benefit of the doubt and just try to lubricate these threads just a touch. And I suppose I'll put some paper towels down on the desk here so we don't get it all gooped up. Protect this thing just slightly. Let's see what we can do here with these screws. Well, that's a good sign. I mean, this screwdriver barely fits in there, but that one came loose right away. So, not a bad sign. Look at the schmoo coming out of that. It's built up in the threads. Yeah, this definitely needed to be done years and years ago. That's the spring right there. Oh, come on, baby. It's right there. Good grief. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh. The bottom is still kind of grease, but the top is basically completely devoid of lubricity. It's just a, a paste. I figured we'd probably run into that, so not terribly surprising, given the fact that I don't think this thing has ever been serviced. same condition. Yeah, that grease, uh, that grease needed to go. Eesh. Well, those springs are, I'm not even going to bother cleaning those springs because we got new ones coming. So now the one thing I did not bring down here with me is my torch to heat these up. Typically how you do this with these bearing caps is that you heat up the outside here without heating up the cover and that causes it to expand just enough to allow those to pop out. We're gonna give it a few wraps with a brass hammer here and see if they'll pop out without heating it. And if I have to go back up and get my torch, I will. Oh, looks like it wants to move. It's definitely on its way out. Let's see what happens here. I don't wanna hit this thing too hard. Oh, there it is. I got it right there. No heat required. That's good. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That smells like white lithium grease, maybe? It's not white anymore? <laughs> That's one. Let's see if we'll get lucky on both sides here without any heat. Oh, okay. That one was a little bit more anxious to, to go. This looks like it got water in it at some point, which honestly wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, and down inside here, there are ball bearings. So I'm gonna shut up and just uh, get cracking on this thing and see if I can't get these pistons out. Cams should just come out. I don't want to pry on them too hard because I know they're. Oh, there we go. Wow, look at all that grease coming out as one big conglomeration of yuts. That's not a solid thing. That's. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awful. Yeah, this poor thing was overdue for some service, I think. Oh, did we get the bearing at the same time? I think we did. We did. All right, that's the ball bearing right there. And that is what, oh my gosh, that's like 
taffy. Let's see if we can see if we can get this cam out of the bearing without messing the bearing up. There we go. Yeah, this got wet at some point. There's a little bit of corrosion. Not much. It's very, very slight. It's all right. That story will be told when we get this thing into the ultrasonic cleaner. Because that is the next stop for this whole thing. All right. See if we can repeat that on this side. The whole smash. There it is. And that is free. Excellent. Same thing with this, good grief. Wow, no wonder this thing wasn't re rebounding very well. Look at how much hair and nasty crap is mixed in with this grease. Can you guys see that? I'm talking into my tripod here, so I really can't see where the camera is. Maybe here, here we go. Look at that. That was inside, on the inside edge of this bearing, where the, the pedal would be here. Look at all that crap. That's like, that, that stuff that I just peeled off, that's rock hard. So, no wonder this thing was having so many issues rebounding properly. This stuff is like, it's like crystallized on there, it's really hard. So, this is going to move much, much, much more smoothly when we're finished with it. Oof. All right, one more thing to do is to get the toe clamp off of there. Now, if memory serves, there should be a, a hole. Yeah, there's a hole on either side where you can get in with a punch to drive that out. So that's pretty simple. Same thing we just did, except I think I'm going to have to bump it up to the next size of roll pin punch. And again, these roll pin punches, if you've never seen or used these before, this is actually out of a gunsmithing set that I own for building uh, rifles. Um, but a roll pin punch is just like a regular straight punch, except it has this little nipple on the end of it. So it centers itself inside the roll pin when you're driving it out. That way it doesn't damage or mushroom the end of the pin. Since roll pins are obviously just a rolled piece of steel, they're hollow. So this, this keeps the pin centered and keeps you from mangling it too badly. So. And that fits right through this hole. Let's see, this is not completely centered, I don't think. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. It is centered actually, it's just this has some clay in it. So it doesn't matter what side we start with, so we'll just go from here. Oh look, beating on it got one of our pistons part of the way out, that's good. Yep. We'll have to see. That one's pretty close. We'll have to see if we can get that one out next. Okay. That comes off now. And there's our roll pin. And as you can see, that's the side we were driving it from. And it keeps that hole nice and opened and it doesn't collapse or screw up the end of the pin if you're using one of those roll pin punches. So that's kind of nice. All right. Last thing to do here. That keeps moving closer and closer to the end. I wonder if I can just tap on this. There it is. Yeah, there's been some moisture inside here. All these things have indications of Corrosion starting underneath the grease. And this one looks bent slightly, which is pretty common. Yeah, there's there's some rust starting on these things, but that's okay. We're gonna get all these parts cleaned up. I wish I had a sandblasting cabinet. That's the one thing I don't have. And nor do I have my big Atlas Copco compressor. I mean it's here, it's in the garage, but again, that's 240 volt compressor. I don't have 240 volt service. So I am SOL on that. But I do have my little uh Campbell Hosfeld compressor, which probably couldn't run a blast cabinet to save its own life. Anyway, that's going to be it for this segment. We got the, everything broken down into pieces. Got everything sitting here. It clearly uh, needed a lot of lubrication. I mean, it has a lot of lubrication, but it's not really lubrication anymore. It's like taffy. 
So that is pretty much the entirety of a Ludwig speed cam with the exception of the footboard and everything, but we'll deal with that again um, in a, another segment of this. So anyway, I'm going to go drop this stuff into the ultrasonic cleaner and uh, let it cook probably overnight. I mean, it won't run that long, but the heat will stay on. It only runs in 30 minute intervals. But uh, yeah, we're going to strip all this grease and crap off. We're going to make sure these bearings are okay. Um, they're probably fine. Once we get all this crap out of them, we'll be all right. Yeah, those feel fine. They're just, they're not crunchy and they're not rusty or anything. They just have a, a lot of dried, nasty grease in there. So maybe I'll find some mineral spirits or some denatured alcohol if I can find any of that stuff in my garage. It's all in boxes right now. Um, we'll soak these bearings, get all the old grease cleaned out of them, and then we'll repack them. I have some uh, Amsoil racing grease. Um, it's a synthetic-based racing grease, which is way overkill for this application, but um, I like the idea of using a synthetic in these just in case I, I don't get to it again for a while. I know that that synthetic grease is going to last a good long time in there without uh, drying out or having any issues. So. Anyway, enough chatting from me. Let's go get this stuff cleaned up and keep on trucking with it. We still have a lot of work to do. All right, everybody. Here are the parts after they've gone through a couple of uh, cycles of ultrasonic cleaning. And all I used as a detergent was uh, regular tap water and Dawn dish soap. Uh, I didn't want to use anything too harsh because I didn't want to strip the nickel coating off of any of this stuff, but as it turns out, the coating was in such bad shape on some of these pieces, like especially these end caps, that it uh, started flaking off anyway. Not a big deal. Um, this will be a good opportunity for me to maybe try my hand at uh, nickel plating some stuff. Maybe I can polish these up, get a nice shine going on them, and then get some nickel plating solution in my power supply and... Go from there, see if we can't replate some of this stuff. Here are the springs, I ended up throwing them in there anyway, um, just to see how well it would work. And those came out nice and squeaky clean. I did just take a paper towel and kind of screw the coil down through the paper towel, if that makes sense, just to kind of get some of the yuts out from the inside there. So that's fine. <clears throat> but another example of the nickel coating just being completely blown off, you can see on this wing nut here, not only is that ear bent a little bit, but the coating in all the high wear areas is just gone. So I might try to do the same thing with this, try to polish this up and then replate it. The chrome stuff though, these just came out absolutely beautiful. Uh, obviously there's some wear on them, but I mean, considering the age, they turned out really, really nicely. So that's a, a really, really happy discovery. There's not a whole lot I need to do with these. I was going to try to soda blast them or something, but I really don't think that's necessary. I mean, these cleaned up just really nicely. So those look pretty good. Um, one thing I did find, though, is that on these pistons, both of the rod ends are bent. And interestingly enough, which I forget which one it is. I think it's this one. Yeah. These are not one piece. These actually have splines. I don't know if the camera's going to pick that up or not. There we go. Maybe. Come on, camera. You can do it. Yeah, those actually have splines machined into them, which have completely worn out. And they're actually pressed in. This was made back before the days of CNC machining um, on a mass scale like it is today. I thought that this would be a really simple thing to just turn down on a lathe out of just some steel round stock and just have that little piece on the end machined in there. But apparently they found it easier and faster to make these separately and then press them in. This one is still rock solid. This one I might have to just epoxy back in place or something. I mean, all this is is a guide pin for the spring. So it's not, you know, hugely critical that those things are, you know, perfectly centered or anything, but I still want to get it as straight as possible. It's obviously quite bent. I, I tried to straighten it a little bit earlier, but it still has a little bit of some, some wobbly stuff going on to it. And this one you can see I have not tried to straighten it all yet, and it not the easiest thing to see with this wood grain pattern on this desk, but it's a little bit wobbly as well. But we'll get that straightened out, and it should be fine. But the uh, happiest surprise that I found was actually using my ultrasonic cleaner to clean the, the upright portion of the pedal. And I had this thing set to its maximum temperature, which is 80 degrees Celsius, which I believe is about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty toasty. 
Um, and it's been in here all, all afternoon yesterday, all night, and all day today. But as you may or may not be able to tell just yet, oh man, that thing is still, it's been, it's been off for a while. But it's still pretty warm, but let me set this on the table here. Probably going to get water all over everything, but that's all right. But if you are seeing what I'm seeing, just the heat and the vibration and the water have got underneath this silver hammer tone paint and has caused the paint to come off. So without bead blasting or anything, I've gotten a very, very clean uh, cast aluminum surface here. Obviously, I'm still going to need to go through and, and wire brush a lot of these areas just to get the remainder of the paint off. But, I mean, it's just coming off in chunks. So, that was a happy discovery. We'll just go ahead and get this thing completely cleaned up with a wire wheel. I might even go so far as to file or sand out these, you know, casting seams and everything and try to get that cleaned up. And obviously, there's some, you know, bits of gunk and grease that are still in there. And probably these shafts will need to be <laughs> bubbles in there. <laughs> these shafts are going to need to be brushed out. Obviously, I mean you, you can't vibrate all that schmoo out. Even even leaving it soak in there as long as I have, that's going to have to be manually removed, which is fine. But the majority of the crud is out of there, and this will be ready for some fresh paint very shortly. So I think the next step here is going to be putting the the pedal board and pedal into the ultrasonic cleaner as best I can. It's not going to fit in there very well. But we'll see if we can't get the same result on this bottom piece because this is a better view of that hammer tone paint that's on there currently. I'm pretty sure that's factory. I don't think this has ever been messed with or repainted or anything. So we'll get some Rust-Oleum hammer tone silver paint, which should be a pretty close match. And we will get this thing all cleaned up and ready to rock and roll. Um, but for right now, I'm going to drop this thing into the ultrasonic cleaner and I'll catch up with you guys tomorrow and see how this turned out. So until tomorrow. All right, guys, here we are the next day. It is now Saturday, so happy weekend to all of you, even though it's probably not going to be the weekend when this gets posted. <laughs> but we got all the parts out. Um, I ended up soaking the small parts in some uh, naphtha overnight just to make sure any grease that was on there is dissolved and off of them. Not sure what I'm going to do about this guy yet. I might actually just try to get some... Uh, I, I haven't put a, a caliper or a micrometer on this yet. I still need to do that. But I'm going to see if I can find some round stock that is the same size as this. And either press it in. Or if I can't find anything exactly this size, I might need to bust out the lathe. And that'll add a whole level of complexity to this. But I might just need to turn something down to fit in here. Um, I don't, I'm not really too confident in just epoxying this old one back in, plus this old one is bent, and I don't think I'll ever be able to get it perfectly straight just because of how much those springs were cranked up and how long they were sitting that way in storage. I think that's probably why <clears throat> these things got bent to begin with. There was just so much spring tension, you know, sitting on them. You can see the, the marks from the springs that have worn into the sides of these things because there was so much tension on it, so... I think just replacing this rod would probably be the best way to go if I can find something, you know, quick and easy. If not, I'll just end up probably epoxying this one back in. Anyway, we're back onto the uh, footboard now. As you can see, we've got some paint flaking off of it. So, pretty similar to the situation with the upright section of the pedal. Um, we let this soak overnight. And while I got you guys on camera here, I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to go ahead and grind off one side of this... Uh, pin that's in here and we're going to see how bad these things are hogged out. There's a lot of slop and a lot of play in here so I just want to know what I'm up against. Um, I'm not going to be reusing this pedal anytime soon. I still need to get new heads and everything for the drum which are hugely expensive. I forgot how expensive they were so to, to re-kit the entire thing with new heads is probably going to cost me over 300 bucks. Anyway, got the Milwaukee angle grinder here. We're just going to zip one head of this pin off, and it looks like this one over here is thinner. And then I'll kind of go through in more detail what happened in the uh, ultrasonic cleaner overnight. There we go. That was a little bit more tedious than I was expecting, but... I kind of lightly scored the surface of this, but I'm not terribly worried about it because I'm going to sand all that down anyway, so that's not a huge deal. Just push all this aside for now. So, I've got the pieces apart here. Okay. Oh, there's one of our bushings. So just 
stamp out. As you can see, that one's about halfway gone. I'll tell you what, guys, I have seen a lot worse. I'm actually pretty surprised at how, uh, how good those holes look. This one's egged out just a little bit, but this bushing is still entirely intact. Sup amazingly, I, I thought for sure it was going to be worn all the way through, but this hole is just fine. This one is worn in half, as is pretty common, but I think, I think that just might be a salvageable hole. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see once we get the rest of this cleaned up completely, because we still have obviously a lot of work to do on this. Um, same story with the ultrasonic cleaner. It, this is steel, so it didn't come off quite as cleanly as the aluminum did. It's still stuck on there pretty good. So I might end up putting some citrus strip on here just to do the rest of the job for me, but I'm going to start with the wire brush here real quick and just see if I can knock some of this stuff off. And then again, I mentioned I don't have a, a blasting cabinet or anything, but I did find my little handheld, you know, El Cheapo Nico Soda Blaster from Amazon. So I'll have to see if I can get that thing going. I do, I do have a bucket of blasting media. It's just really, really fine grit abrasive, so I'm not sure how well it's going to work on this, but we'll see. Yeah, it's coming off. It's just uh, still stuck pretty good. Okay. I think that soda blasting this will definitely be the best way to go if I can get that going, but we've got this thing apart. The holes are actually in miraculously good shape, so I might be able to do something different with that without boring anything out. So, next step for this thing is going to be getting it cleaned up. I'll see if I can get my soda blaster going, and if I do, I will certainly bring you guys back for the result of that. So, anyway, more here shortly. Okay, everybody, we are back again, and I'm actually really excited about how this has turned out so far. I managed to find my little handheld soda blaster thing and got some pretty amazing results with it. Here we go. I'm going to go ahead and pull these pieces out individually and show everything to you guys. So give me a second here. This is the, the base plate for the footboard. If you guys can see that. Got a nice strong profile on that. And then. I mentioned I was going to file, file down the casting marks and stuff on that, and I couldn't resist. I actually did it. I didn't go as crazy as I thought I would, because I started uncovering some, some casting defects and, and little pock marks and stuff in here, so I, I didn't want to go filing it you know, down too much and risk uh, damaging the actual casting. But I did go through all down here, got these little mold marks out, smoothed this area out on both sides. The vertical casting lines where the seams were, I smoothed those out inside and out on both sides. And then the tops of the caps here probably came out the best. And then, um, yes, I did use a handheld little soda blaster, no cabinet or anything because I, I don't have one. But I ended up going to my local tractor supply company and buying some uh, coal slag fine abrasive which is in most cases when you're using using it on aluminum way way too aggressive but because i just have a little soda blaster and a tiny air compressor i kind of held my distance a little bit and i got a really really beautiful profile on the on the aluminum here so i'm going to hit this with some self-etching primer and then i got a can of uh, rust-oleum hammered silver and we're going to go ahead and repaint this and this with that hammered silver i'm going to go ahead and set this aside for the time being um, I left the pin in this just because I wanted to test fit this guy and make sure that hooked on properly. This thing was completely out of whack. This, uh, the bottom of the footboard here, that was completely goofed up um, when I took it apart. The bend, there's usually a kind of an S bend in this thing from the factory. That way it can hook onto the pedal and not have this little hook actually sticking down below the level of the pedal, if that makes sense. Um, and it's just, it's too close to the actual hook here for me to get in there and straighten that out. But this S-Bend was completely gone. So I just used my vise and kind of re-bent it and kind of tested it and took it out and bent it more and tested it until I got it to the point where this will attach and sit pretty flat. It's not perfect, but 
this is twisted a little bit and I just I every time I'd mess with it and try to untwist it it just got worse so I quit while I was ahead and kind of left it as it was and it's not perfectly flat down there you can still kind of really push down on that and, and lift the thing up but for our purposes what I'm using this thing for a nice thick carpeted surface down here that's going to be totally fine so these will both both of these pieces are going to get a nice hammered silver rust-oleum finish and a rust-oleum clear coat I wanted to go with a 2k clear coat on this thing but it's like 25 bucks a can guys it's just not in the budget for this project and the problem with the 2k clear coat I buy it in the rattle cans because again I have HVLP guns but I don't have a big enough compressor to really run it adequately so I just like to use the the clear coat in the spray cans but with 2k once you activate it you have to use everything in the can or it hardens in the can within 24 hours and it's just it's too expensive it's too expensive to get you know I need maybe a quarter of a can to put two coats on this and it's just not worth it so we're not going to bother going with the 2k I wanted to but it's just not going to not going to fly money wise I just don't want to put that kind of cash into this little project I'm doing what I can with what I got and I want to do it as cheaply as possible but I do have a 10 gallon bucket of actual sodium bicarb blast media and this thing came out just gorgeous I mean it is nice beautiful white clean aluminum again you know how you saw how dark it oxidized it got pulling it out of the ultrasonic cleaner this turned out really really nicely so when all is said and done there I'm not sure what I want to do with this exactly. Obviously it's going to have to be protected somewhat because bare aluminum like this will oxidize just as it's exposed to air. So um, I didn't spend as much time on the bottom as I did on the top obviously because this is where you know you're going to see it. But I'm debating if I want to go with like an aluminum blackening agent down here like in the base below where the lettering and stuff is and then just take some scotch bright and kind of give this a nice brushed aluminum finish and then clear coat it so you have some dark behind the, the logo. That's kind of something I'm debating. Not sure what route I'm going to go with that just yet. Um, did lose a little bit of the, the blackening off of this, uh, this little spring pin here. Not a big deal. I can hit that with some cold blue and bring that right back around so that's fine. Um, ended up leaving the pins in this and in the base plate like I said because I wanted to kind of test fit stuff as I went. But the... Uh, other thing and what is in this box is the other keys to the uh, the puzzle here I went and did some shopping at McMaster car and I did spend about 25 bucks on this stuff which is more than I wanted to spend but really the parts themselves were only $13 but then the 12 bucks for shipping is kind of what killed it on the price but I ended up finding perfect oil light bushings for this. I ended up getting four. Just to, they're, they're cheap enough. I think they're only like 68 cents a piece. But these are actual oil light bushings, quarter inch inner diameter, and five sixteenths outer diameter. Nice and thick. And they are a perfect fit inside this pedal. I mean, I, you could not ask for something more close to OEM. Right for McMaster car. Now the other thing that we have to consider here is due to the fact that this pin is basically form riveted in place, probably with a big die I would imagine at the factory, I'm not really sure how they did it back in the day, but we don't have the machinery or the capabilities of really doing this OEM style if that makes sense. But what I decided to do, I just went, again for McMaster car, I went on and got a three and a quarter inch long. 516s per precision ground uh, pin. This is a basically a precision ground pin that fits perfectly inside these bushings. No slop at all. I mean, it, it, it's at like almost a zero clearance fit. I mean, maybe a half a thou. So very, very tight fit, perfect fit. And then I got these collars to hold it on at both ends. It's going to look something kind of like this. Go ahead and got our footboard here. I'll try to do the three-handed game and try to put this together myself here. So with everything put together, it'll look kind of like that. I'm 
kind of holding it at the end there so you get the gist. But that looks pretty decent, pretty clean. Now, and the nice thing is you can really finely adjust the positions of these collars on there so you're not going to have to worry about it rubbing on the footboard or, you know, interfering with anything. And, you know, really super easy to swap out if I ever want to swap these bushings out again if they wear out for whatever reason. Like I said, I ended up buying four of them because they were so cheap and they're a perfect match. I mean, I didn't realize how perfect they were when I first ordered them, but they showed up today and I looked at this and I'm like, holy crap, I got to film another segment and show everybody. Um, I will try, to, if I remember, I will put the information about all of this in the description. But I mean, if you just go to McMaster Car and Google, you know, oil light bushings, quarter inch inner diameter, these are going to be one of the first ones that pop up. The length is not, you can't select how long they are, but these just happen to be absolutely perfect without even trying. So really, really lucky break on my end, but I think that this is going to be a really slick, clean solution for a problem without worrying about hammering on anything or, you know, potentially risking fracturing any of these aluminum castings by trying to hammer pins in place and round them over while they're installed. And like I said, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to remove the pin and swap the bushings out again if I ever need to service this thing again in the future. So. Anyway, I'm going to go hit this, uh, the footboard, the bottom of the footboard and the upright section of the pedal with some primer and then I'll let that dry and then I will uh, hit it with the Rust-Oleum uh, hammered silver and get that all done and ready to go and then we will come back and figure out exactly how we're going to go about sealing the footboard, whether or not I'm going to color it in, put any black or anything down in here. Um, you know, the original ones didn't have any colorization or anything in there. They were just plain. So part of me kind of wants to leave it that way. But I also like being able to clearly read these super cool old school Ludwig logos and all the information and everything. So I don't know. Kind of mulling that over. I'd be curious as to what you guys think. So go ahead and leave me a comment about that if, that's, uh, if you have any opinions one way or the other. Um, I think I'm going to wrap this video up here because it's already getting to be super long. It's probably going to be close to an hour long and I haven't even put anything back together yet. So uh, we'll split this into two parts. Second part, you'll come back and we will have everything painted and ready to go. And then we'll work on the actual pedal and reassembly. So anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it very much. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave me a comment. I'll do my best to get back to you. But in the meantime, you guys be safe, have fun, and we'll see you guys for part two. Take care, everybody. See ya.